All right, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Hey, I really am excited for this series that we're starting into. Over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at passages of Scripture where people powerfully encountered God, and it changed their lives. And what we're going to do is we're going to see, in each of these encounters, we're going to see something that we can learn about the character and nature of God himself. We're going to see things we can learn about us, and then we're going to see things that we can learn about our lives. And I love this title, this Close Encounters of the God Kind, because when I was 10 years old, in 1977, a groundbreaking movie came out by Steven Spielberg called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> okay, I'm dating myself a little bit here. But it was a groundbreaking movie. I mean, Steven Spielberg had just come off of a epic film called Jaws. And here was his next movie that he was going to produce. And in essence, why I think this movie captured people was, is because all of us want to know, is there something more out there? Is there something more than just our human experience that we are experiencing right now? Is there something more than just what we see and fe can feel and touch and hear? Is there something transcendent that's out there? So this movie hit a chord, it hit a nerve in our country, and it became a blockbuster. I think originally when Steven Spielberg was going to do it, he pitched the movie company a $2.5 million budget, and it ended up, I believe, being $19.7 million to produce it. But it made just hundreds of millions of dollars. Because here's the thing, guys is that encounters change our lives. Encounters change our lives. I was reading this week about a famous actor named Harrison Ford. And Harrison Ford kind of decided to get into the whole acting thing late in life. It was actually when he was in college, he decided to get into acting. And he moved out to Hollywood to pursue acting and really wasn't making it. And Columbia actually said to him that he had no future in acting in Hollywood or in film. That Harrison Ford, they said, he has no future. And so what Harrison Ford began to do was Harrison Ford began to do carpentry work to supply and for his family. And his, one of his friends at that time, Fred Rouse, had an idea. He said, hey, listen, I know that they are casting for kind of a movie that I think is going to be a big deal coming up that's going to be called Star Wars. And I know where they're going to be doing the casting. And so Fred hired him, Harrison Ford, to come and do carpentry work right where George Lucas was going to be doing the interviews for the casting of Star Wars. And the rest, they say, is history. It was serendipitous, they said that when George Lucas met Harrison Ford, he said, you're Han Solo. You're Han Solo. Encounters change our lives. And what we see in the Bible is that God has all kinds of encounters with all kinds of different people. We see in the New Testament, we see Jesus encountering a woman at the well, and it changed her life. We see Jesus encountering a religious leader who was looking for more than just dead religion, and it changed his life. 
We see Jesus encountering people who needed healing, who needed encouragement, who needed hope. And their encounter with him changed their life. This morning, I want to start our series out by going to the Old Testament, to a, the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 16, where we're going to look at a woman named Hagar who powerfully encountered God. And we're going to see what we can learn from this for our lives. If you have your Bible or on your device, turn with me to Genesis 16. Let me give you a little bit of background about what's happening here in Genesis. Uh, in the beginning of Genesis, we have God creating, right? God creating the heavens and the earth, God creating mankind. They're in great fellowship with God. All of a sudden, man decides to go his own way and, and sins and that fellowship and relationship is broken in Genesis chapter 3 and God begins to work to bring redemption to the world and he comes to a man named Abraham in Genesis 11 and he calls Abraham to leave what is familiar to him to go to this on this journey into this place that he doesn't really know where he's going. And so he takes his family in Genesis chapter 12 and he begins to leave on this journey. And we're gonna pick this story up because God had promised Abraham that he was gonna be a father of a multitude. He had promised Abraham great blessing and great influence. Starting in verse one, it says this, now Sarai, who later became Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. At one point in time, there, there had been a famine in the land, and Abraham and his family had gone down to Egypt for provision and while they were there there was lots of challenges that they went through and as they came back out of Egypt they had been given uh, uh, resources they had been given people so this woman Hagar had been kind of given to Abraham and Sarai uh, as they're heading back to on their journey so she said to Abram the Lord has kept me from having children Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. What was happening here is that uh, Hagar now, because uh, in this particular time of the world, to be able to, to uh, bring children forth, to be fruitful, was a sign of blessing, was a sign of honor, was a sign of prestige. So here, she, here the servant was Hagar, who now is pregnant, and she begins to get a little... Uh, cocky and a little condescending towards Sarai and it's it's irritating Sarai so then Sarai said to Abram you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she's pregnant she despises me may the Lord judge between you and me your slave is in your hands Abraham said do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar. So she fled from her. One of the things that you're going to see in this particular passage of Scripture is that people can do really, really horrendous things. I was reading a book years ago uh, I believe it was 
Christopher Hitchens, who's a atheist. He's a part of the neo-atheists. There's Dawkins and Hitchens and Sam Harris and all these guys who really attack Christianity and the faith. And he wrote a book called God is Not Good. And it became a bestseller. And I got about halfway through the book and I put it down and I said, I wish he would have retitled it, People Are Not Good. <laughs> because every example that he was using was people. I'm like, those wars that you're referencing here, that's people. This abuse that you're, you're referencing here, that's people. So even Abraham and Sarai, who were called and part of the covenant family of God, they're still prone to, to error. She began to despise her. Do whatever you wish. Sarah mistreated Hagar. There's something in this story that we need to see. So Hagar fled from her. She leaves this, this situation. Hagar finds herself in the midst of significant pain, brokenness, mistreatment, and distress. Life's circumstances had been hard on Hagar. Been hard. Come on. Can anybody say, been there? Come on. Distress. Here she is in this place of distress. Verse 8, 7 and 8. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. The angel of the Lord, many people believe that when you study this in commentaries, the angel of the Lord that's being referenced here is actually a pre-incarnate Jesus. And we're going to see, even in the Old Testament, in Genesis 16, we're going to see what kind of God we praise and serve and love. He is a God of infinite compassion. Of infinite compassion. I don't want to worship a God. I want to worship a God like this. I want to, that's who I want to be close to and worship. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. Really interesting backstory on this, guys. Because guess what? This woman came out of Egypt and had gone to the promised land as a slave and now was fleeing from oppression and abuse and mistreatment. And where she stopped on the way back to Egypt is the very place that the children of Israel would stop when they were coming out of Egypt as slaves, when everything was reversed. This place that she stops is the very place where God turned the bitter water to sweet. It's powerful. The angel of the Lord, here's Jesus, here's pre incarnate visiting her. He found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Interesting that in the first, this is the first time in Scripture that anybody calls Hagar by her first name. Go back and read. She's always just called that slave girl. And God comes to her in her distress, in her brokenness, in her hurt, in her pain. And God comes to her, and he's tender with her. He calls her by her first name, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. She answered, 
Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall call him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard of your misery. She gave this name to the Lord. She has an encounter. Come on. She's from Egypt. Other gods. Lots of other gods. Lots of deities. Here she is as a slave. She's fleeing. She's on the run. She's walking back from Canaan by herself. She's walking back. It's like you and I saying, hey man, we're just going to walk to Oklahoma City. She's walking. And she encounters God. And God dignifies her. And God speaks tenderly to her. And God has compassion on her. And God speaks to her future. That everything is going to be okay. You're going to have lots of descendants. Look at what she says. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one, capital O, I have now seen the one who sees me. I've encountered this God who knows me intimately, who created me, who has a hope and a future for me. This is the encounter that she has. What can we pull out of this passage of Scripture? Number one, that God sees our lives. God sees us. Come on. I love this. I remember being in ninth grade. And ninth grade was one of the hardest years of my life because my mom got remarried, and that wasn't the hard part. I have a great stepfather. But my mom got remarried, and we moved about 10 minutes away from one school to another halfway through the year. And not only was it one school to another, it was our rival school. It was moving from Westlake to Lake Travis. Or Rouse to Vista. Or who's your rival? Cedar Park to Vanderbilt. There we go. Now we're talking. Now we're humming. There we go. But we had moved to uh, the next town over, which was the rival, all the kids I had grown up competing against. And I got there my freshman year. As soon as football season ended, on a Thursday, the next day I was in school on a Friday, and basketball tryouts started on Monday. And I ended up beating out the most popular kid in school for the starting position. So I was already a bad guy. And it was one of my loneliest years and at the end of the year, we were in a basketball tournament, and I was so desiring to want to prove myself. And we had a really popular player in our county who, when he was in ninth grade, he had gotten MVP of this little county tournament, and he had gone on and done really well at high school as a sophomore. And I thought, if I can be MVP, my future set. So I shot 25 times in a freshman game and made six. And we lost. And nobody on the team talked to me for the remainder of the year. 
Come on, there's like movies about this kind of stuff. I remember going to school my freshman year and just going into the library and the lights were all off and I would just be in there by myself. And I remember telling my mom, I just want to transfer. I want to go to a different school, all this. And God visited me. He said, it's going to be okay. Trust me. My hand is in this. Don't, don't worry. He strengthened me. Come on, how many are you glad that we have a God who sees when we're in distress? Come on. I, I'm glad that this is the kind of God that we serve. He sees us. He sees our situation. But not only does he see, he cares. He cares. His love is always at work toward redemption and restoration. It's always at work. He sees, but he cares. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we pro profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one, Jesus, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can see in this Old Testament story of Hagar, we can see that God, God is a God who sees. He's a God who cares he cares. That's why he came. He saw our situation and our condition and our lostness and our hopelessness. And that's why he came. And he was moved with compassion. That's what moved him, I believe, to, to leave heaven, to come into our situations. Matthew 9 says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was what? He was moved with compassion for them. Because he said they are like sheep without a shepherd. He said, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into to the harvest. Everywhere we, we look, Jesus was, he was moved with compassion for the broken. He was moved with compassion for the rejected. He was moved with compassion for the lost. He was moved with compassion for the hurting. That's what, that's what he did. This woman was hurting. She was hurting. So God not only sees, and God not only cares, but God acts. He acts. God's love is a responsive love. It's responsive to all the circumstances of our human experience. He, did, he didn't just see her and have pity and empathy. First, he, just, he, he didn't just see her and have indifference towards her. Come on. That's something that Jesus was constantly working through because he comes to the Pharisees and their hearts were so hardened, their mindsets were if somebody was going through a hard time, a difficult time, well, guess what? You must have done something wrong. You must be a bad person. And Jesus was, was changing the mindsets of people, trying to, to get the religious people from having indifference and hard-heartedness to actually compassion. 
So he didn't just see it and just dismiss it and say, well, she's getting what she deserves. She's not important, right? She's not part of my covenant family with Abraham. She's not important. He didn't do that. He saw. He had empathy. He had compassion. It caused him to act and to move and to come visit her and to dignify her and to be tender towards her and to talk about her future and to encourage her and to tell her to give her direction for her life go back it's going to be okay he strengthened her in that moment so he sees he cares he acts look at what it says in john 6 38 jesus talking for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me he acted he came down this is the god this is the kind of god we serve but guess what yes he sees yes he cares Yes, he acts, but then guess what? He sends. He sends. In the same way that he visited Hagar, a rejected outcast, he calls us to carry that same heart and that same compassion to the world around us. We are invited to see God's redemptive activity in our lives and in the world. We're we're invited to see that, that he knows us, he sees us, he sees our situations he sees our brokenness he sees when we've been rejected he sees when we're going through a hard time he sees when we have financial need he sees when we're going through a difficult marriage situation he sees when we're going through a difficult thing at work he he sees all that and he's moving and he's acting on our behalf this is the kind of god that we serve and he invites us to see that but he also invites us to participate in his redemptive activity in the world. And our world right now needs people who who will get beyond just our own situations and our own need to, to, to look to those around us. Several years ago when April and I first moved here, we'd moved from Houston to Austin. And we were at our house. And uh, April came to me and she said, uh, hey, do you wanna go to a concert tonight? Who's playing? She said, there's a concert that's going down in, at University of Texas. Rich Mullins, who's a Christian artist, is playing down there tonight with uh, a thing called Res Week, Resurrection Week. I said, man, I love Rich Mullins. Let's go. We grabbed Brett and Elijah. They were really small. Brett was three. Elijah was one. We jumped in. We only lived 15 minutes from the campus. We parked. We get out. And on the big mall there, they have it all set up. And we hear the music. And Rich Mullins is, I'm like, man, this is awesome. And we come. And there's probably about, I don't know, maybe 
700, 800 people out there. And we're sitting there and got the strollers and all this. And I'm watching, I'm sitting here and I'm watching Rich Mullins. And I look to my left and I see a lady with a stroller and she's walking and she stops. She's probably about 22 years old. And she stops and she literally does a head tilt. She stops and she goes, and God says to me, she's in distress. Go share my gospel with her. You can ask April when we leave here. Her name was Brandy. Her husband's name was Brian. I go over to her and I said, hey, how are you? She goes, I'm doing okay. What's going on here? I said, it's a Christian concert. This is Resurrection Week, Res Week. So they brought this guy in, and he's kind of a famous. And I said, has anybody ever shared the, the gospel with you? She said, no. I said, has anybody ever shared the good news of, of Jesus Christ, that who he was, that he, he loves you, and he cares about you, and he came for you, and he died on the cross for you, that you could be part of the family of God. You could have redemption. You could have forgiveness, right? She said, no. Nobody's ever shared this. And I said, do you care if I share it with you? She said, no. I ended up sharing, and my... Bible back then, I actually had the plan of salvation scriptures in the, the front pages written down. And I just walked her through and I said, would you like to, to receive Jesus? And she said, yes. And I said, can we pray for you right now? And we began to pray for her. And this joy just came on, on her. And she said, would you be willing to meet with my husband as well? Because he's kind of messed up too. Come on, what we see in the story of Hagar is, is scandalous grace. It's amazing grace. It's scandalous grace. And she goes, he's messed up too. We said, yes. We invited him over to the house and she said, Brian, these are the people that, and we sat down and we shared it with him and he received the Lord. And we started meeting with them and doing counseling with their man and different things and and God began to supernaturally change them and then they asked us one day they said could people like us come to your church I'm like oh yeah because we're all messed up we all need grace and mercy and forgiveness absolutely come and they lived right down on campus and we were meeting at that time at the devil tree hotel the downtown campus and they began to come and god began to do an incredible work in their life god is a god who sees he says he saw her misery God is a God who cares. God is not impotent. He's not up there. God cares. He came. He, he not only cares, he acts. And then he calls us 
to carry this same compassion and the same mercy to see people who might be lost, who might be desperate, who might be confused, who need hope in their life, who need what I read an article this week and it said, the angel of the Lord restored hope to her. There are all people all around us. God sees, God cares, God acts, God sends. One of the, I'm telling you, life comes alive when we are, position ourselves in a way to say, maybe it's just a word to somebody who's discouraged. Maybe it's just sitting with them at the lunch table. Maybe it's just uh, befriending. Love, serving, helping. That's what we see here. This is who God is. I can worship this kind of God. I can worship this kind of God. Close encounters of the God kind. Hagar encountered God, it changed her life. We encounter God, it changes our lives. We carry that, and then people encounter God through us. That's what I'm excited about. Close encounters of the God kind. God, let me pray. God, thank you so much that you're not a God who's indifferent. You're not a God who judges. You're a God who includes you're a God of mercy. You're a God of compassion. You see every situation that we're in. You see when we're hurt. You see when we're desperate. You see when we're hopeless. You see when we're broken. You see, God, you see. And God, you have the power to come and, and do something about it. I thank you that that's who you are. We worship you this morning. We give you praise. God, let us carry this to the world that people would encounter this kind of God through our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name.